This episode of The Cyberwire is made possible in part by SpyCloud. Stolen data circulating on the criminal underground is fuel for data breaches, account takeover, ransomware attacks, and online fraud. Your biggest security risk might be a breach or malware infection outside of your control that leaks the data of your users. SpyCloud constantly recaptures and analyzes new data from the criminal underground, powering solutions that proactively protect over 2 billion employees and consumers worldwide. Learn how to make recaptured data your best defense at spycloud.com slash cyberwire. That's spycloud.com slash cyberwire. More cyber espionage targets Russian networks. Lincoln Project veterans visit Ukraine with advice on conducting an influence campaign against President Putin. A politically motivated DDoS attack hits the Port of London Authority website. Is our evil back and looking into new criminal techniques, or is a recent DDoS campaign the work of imposters? Ransom House may be operated by frustrated bounty hunters. Kevin McGee from Microsoft sets his security sites towards space. Our guest is Matthew Gorge of Vigitrust to discuss the threat of printer hacks. And Operation Delilah trims Silver Terrier's locks. From the CyberWire studios at Data Tribe, I'm Dave Bittner with your CyberWire summary for Wednesday, May 25th, 2022. Malwarebytes researchers have posted more information on a cyber espionage campaign being run against Russian organizations. The operation implants a remote access Trojan via phishing emails. The fish bait is a bogus security alert. And the emails caution recipients not to open or reply to suspicious emails, which seems a nice touch. A number of recipients appear to have been in the Russian media, notably working at RTTV. Malwarebytes is cautious about saying who's behind the campaign. There are some signs that point to Deep Panda, but there are also code overlaps with TrickBot and Bazaar Loader, and other weak indicators pointing to the Lazarus Group and Tropic Troopers. But some or all of these could be incidental or even deliberate false flags. The researchers conclude... Attribution is difficult, and threat actors are known to use indicators from other groups as false flags. The attribution of the APT behind these campaigns is ongoing, but based on the infrastructure used, we assess with low confidence that this group is a Chinese actor. Mike Madrid and Ron Steslow, co-founders of the anti-Trump Lincoln Project, which they exited as the group became fractious, are talking with Ukrainian officials about propaganda techniques that might work against authoritarians like Russia's President Putin. According to Newsweek, they're not taking money from Ukraine, but are simply discussing a campaign of mutual interest. Madrid and Streslo see the central weakness of an authoritarian regime as its dependence on an image of intimidating competence. The way to beat these guys is to humiliate them, to turn them into a jester, turn them into a clown, they advise, and say it's a mistake to portray an authoritarian leader as demonic. Better to show them as a malign bozo than Milton's Satan. Or, if you prefer Martin Luther's advice from his table talk, the best way to drive out the devil, if he will not yield to texts of scripture, is to jeer and flout him, for he cannot bear scorn. An Iranian group has claimed responsibility for a distributed denial-of-service attack that interfered with the Port of London Authority's website. The authority acknowledged the incident but said that operational systems were unaffected. The group that said it was behind the attack, the Alteria team, is a nominally hacktivist group, Hackreed says, that operates under the direction of the Iranian government. Akamai reports that one of its clients has fallen victim to a distributed denial-of-service attack at the hands of a threat actor claiming to be our evil. The attack contains a wave of HTTP2 GET requests with demands for payment embedded in them, as well as a Bitcoin wallet. The attached Bitcoin wallet, however, has no history and no connection to our evil. 
Researchers noted that this attack seems smaller in scale than most are evil attacks and seems to have a political purpose, which is something not seen before with the group. It's also a DDoS attack, which is outside the old Our Evil playbook. Our Evil had been known for its ransomware-as-a-service offerings in the C2C market. Akamai thinks there are a number of possibilities here. Either the operation is an imposture, trading on Our Evil's remaining reputational equity to spook its victims, or it's Our Evil revived, back and looking into new approaches to crime. Or perhaps it's a splinter group of Our Evil alumni, getting part of the band back together. In any case, the recent attacks and the techniques they display bear watching. Ransom House, a new extortion gang, skips the data encryption customary with conventional ransomware operators and extorts victims by data theft and the threat of doxing. Researchers at CyberInt, who've been tracking the group, note that it claims an elevated purpose— Ransom House objects to the way organizations don't devote enough resources to security and hopes to shove them in the direction of better practices. Ransom House also objects to what it views as a cheapskate tendency with respect to bug bounties, and this suggests to CyberInt that the members of the gang may be frustrated bounty hunters, white hats gone bad. CyberInt says... Throughout their entire introduction process, Ransom House sees themselves as the ones who do what's right and makes excuses, such as, the organizations are the ones to lead us to these actions, as they are avoiding taking any responsibility. Ransom House is practically forcing penetration testing services on organizations that never used their services or rewarded bug bounties. And once they find any vulnerabilities, they fully exploit them to steal as much sensitive data as possible. Ironically, Ransom House announced on their Onion site that they are pro-freedom and support the free market. But on the other hand, they punish organizations that choose to not invest in their protection systems. Yesterday, the U.S. Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency issued four industrial control system security advisories and for immediate action by U.S. federal civilian executive agencies CISA yesterday added 20 issues to its known exploited vulnerabilities catalog, joining the 21 vulnerabilities added Tuesday. The agencies CISA oversees are expected to scan for and fix the vulnerabilities and to report completion by June 14th and June 13th, respectively. And finally, a joint operation by Interpol and the Cybercrime Unit of the Nigeria Police Force have concluded a year-long investigation into the Silver Terrier business email compromise gang by arresting the man they believe is the gang's leader. The investigation, which the police called Operation Delilah, was assisted by three private companies, Palo Alto Networks, Group IB, and Trend Micro. Palo Alto's Unit 42 blog provinces some interesting perspective on how closely and relentlessly the investigators tracked the unnamed suspect's activities. Emailed comments from Group IB highlighted the benefits of public-private cooperation in breaking cybercrime cases. The company's CEO, Dmitry Volkov, said in a statement, Prompt threat intelligence sharing, private-public partnership, and effective multi-party coordination by Interpol's Cybercrime Directorate were crucial to the success of the operation. Congratulations to Interpol, the Nigeria Police Force, and their private sector partners, and may you make many additional callers. And now, a word from our sponsor, Datadome. Security shouldn't come at the expense of privacy. That's the global consensus as organizations face increasingly scrupulous legal requirements for processing users' data. CAPTCHAs are no exception. Datadome's CAPTCHA protects customer privacy while keeping all endpoints safe from bots and online fraud. It processes data at the edge, locally, with zero third-party involvement and data retention options to best meet local regulations. Protect your online business with a solution that prioritizes privacy and user experience. Visit datadome.co to get a free threat assessment. That's datadome.co, and we thank Datadome for sponsoring our show.
For nearly as long as there have been computers in business settings, there have been printers. Those of us of a certain age may have fond memories of tractor-fed dot matrix printers or even daisy wheels. These days, many printers are computers in their own right, often with network access, and that means they deserve security scrutiny. Matthew Gorge is founder and CEO of security risk management firm Vigitrust. They're often forgotten as one of the devices that actually uh, is used to either transfer, manipulate, or, or store data. And then on top of that, uh, a lot of the printers are now wireless printers, and some of them are even smart printers in, in a way that they belong to the deployment of a smart office or a smart home. So as you can see, the risk surface that started with some sort of a, a very private connection for one single function is now completely different. We've got like risk exposure because if you don't purge the the hard drive, you can actually replay all of the all of the jobs that have been that have been printed or scanned or whatever. You can link a document from a printer into your email or your fax service, and therefore. Those services are probably part of your disaster recovery and business continuity plan. So all of the data is backed up and you can see that you can start with one document with confidential information and that document ends up on, on your cloud storage facility. It might end up uh, on your email service and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. So you went from one single piece of data to multiple pieces of data, some of which will never be protected. So what are your recommendations in terms of both making a, a purchasing decision, but then also securing that device once it becomes part of your network? Right. Well, I mean, it, it's like any time you, you add some new functionality uh, that is uh, IT based, you increase your risk surface. So there's always kind of a, a disconnect between making life of uh, making employees lives uh, easier because they, they can work faster, they can be more productive and so on, and, and the security that goes with it. So uh, the first thing to do is to minimize the blind spot. So the same way as you do an asset inventory and you will include all of the endpoints like the, the cell phones, the, the iPads, the laptops and so on, you also need to include those devices that are multifunctional uh, printing and, and document capture devices. They, they granted, it doesn't sound half as sexy as looking at uh, uh, managing 10,000 remote points, but it's actually super important. Um, the next thing to do is to uh, treat them a little bit like a firewall, right? So with a firewall, you only let the traffic in and out if you think there's a business justification. And then you put in security levels on top of it, multi-factor authentication, um, increased login, maybe file integrity software, that type of stuff. You can do the same with, uh, with the printers. Your printers, uh, obviously your network printers are... The networks used to, sorry, the printers used to, to deal with confidential data must be behind the firewall. Um, I would recommend that you use some, uh, functionality, uh, such as follow me printing, which is where, let's say I'm traveling from Dublin to New York and I have to uh, go to a meeting with, to negotiate contracts and so on, instead of printing the contracts, Bring, bringing them with me and I could lose them at any point during the, the trip. I go to my office in New York. I authenticate. The job is there. It's encrypted. Nobody else could get it. And at least it's there in the office and I didn't have to travel with it. I, I would also recommend that you use the native logging functionality that, that, that comes with the, the multifunctional device. And of course that you purge the uh, hard drive automatically at a very regular interval, probably every 30 minutes uh, would be the norm in the, in the industry, but it could be shorter than that, depending on the data. You should also include secure printing and secure document capture best practices in your security awareness training. Same way as you train people to not fall for phishing scams, they should be aware of what's happening uh, at the printing device level. And of course, that the, the overall process needs to be incorporated in your uh, technical policies and procedures. 
um, and in uh, any type of uh, incident response plan because an incident could be linked to an issue with the printer or with the device. Maybe somebody stole the device, maybe uh, the device wasn't purged in time or whatever. So that could potentially become an incident for your organization. So it needs to be part of the incident response plan. That's Mathieu Gorge from Vigitrust. And now, a word from our sponsor, Barracuda. Right now, everyone is talking about cryptocurrency, and the cyber criminals are hiding in the conversation. Cyber criminals use social engineering loaded with urgency and fear to successfully prey on your company, your employees, and your customers. Spear phishing is just one of 13 types of email threats. Barracuda has identified these 13 types and shows you how you can protect your company, your customers, and your reputation. Find out about the 13 email threat types and Barracuda email protection. Get your free ebook at barracuda.com slash cyberwire. And we thank Barracuda for sponsoring our show. And joining me once again is Kevin McGee. He is the Chief Security Officer at Microsoft Canada. Kevin, it's always great to welcome you back to the show. Uh, I wanted to touch today on some of the developments that we are seeing when it comes to space. Uh, On our side of the border, we have famously spun up a space force. um, And it seems like more and more uh, communications, communications, you know, we've got internet providers, uh, Elon Musk's uh, big activity of launching all of his satellites into space. So it's sort of a hot area right now. And I wanted to check in with you to see what kind of stuff you and your colleagues are tracking when it comes to space. Thanks for having me back, Dave. And I thought Space Force was canceled on Netflix or, or whatnot. I, <laughs> I thought I heard that. But uh, that will keep up on, on these things. But uh, I, I really think... We are at this moment with space technology, about 1993, 94 with the internet, where Hmm. we're developing all of these new technologies. They're starting to go mainstream in commercial businesses. And it's only a matter of time before we start launching the Raspberry Pi equivalent of satellites. And I think it's going to happen sooner rather than later. So there's an opportunity right now to start thinking about how do we correct the mistakes we made with with an open internet and having to sort of revamp security as we went, as we rush into the space era, how do we start to build it secure by design? And I'm starting to have many, many more discussions with senior leaders about about these very topics as we see uh, space technology, GPS, communication satellites start to weave their way into critical business processes. What sort of things are, are you seeing here? I mean, what, what are can you give us an example of a use case where uh, satellite communications are critical to someone's business? Sure thing. I had my first um, uh, epiphany, I think my ghost fleet moment, uh, as Peter Singer and August Cole would say, uh, when uh, I read um, ghost fleet and the opening chapter was sort of a thought experiment about how an adversary would attack the u.s and the first thing they did was take out the communication satellites and when you say take out communications that's kind of a broad term when you start to really dig in and what effect that would have it wouldn't just affect the military it would affect businesses it would affect hospitals it would have incredible um, additional effects so i started using this in uh, my boardroom uh, cyber risk education sessions, as I call them rapid fire tabletop exercises, where I throw out a, a scenario and say a solar flare, not even an adversary, but a solar flare takes out a large portion of the communication satellites um, of the world. How would that affect your organization? And the initial response is it wouldn't. But as we start to take apart major critical business situations, we see bank ATMs are updated, um, primarily with satellites in remote locations, satellite phones. All sorts of critical business uh, systems are unknowingly running through satellites that we're not aware of. And if we're not building that into our resiliency plans as organizations, then we're leaving a huge gap open uh, to these potential um, technologies right now. Imagine where we'll be in 10, 15 years reliant on space technologies. Well, who do you suppose should take responsibility for this function? I mean, is this 
Is this a government thing? Is this, uh, you know, again, here in the States, would this be a federal communications type of thing? Is this NASA, the military? Who should uh, lead the way? Well, uh, I think we all have a role to play. When uh, private sector, of course, uh, when we're building these products, we should build them secure by design. Uh, Microsoft is uh, beginning to develop some of these products, and we're, we've actually uh, come up with a preview, something they call the Azure Orbital Ground Station Platform. And uh, we're going to cloud-enable your ability to uh, to build out a satellite uh, infrastructure. We're actually launched a new uh, software-as-a-service version of, of this product as well, too. So we're, we're leveraging new technologies and new design platforms that we can build in secure by design. So leveraging some of these addition, uh, platforms like cloud and whatnot um, to build secure by design is going to be key as well. On the legislation side, uh, interesting, the U.S. has uh, a, sa- a Satellite Cybersecurity Act, which I think is is quite interesting that has asked the uh, the government to go back and look over a year of what effectiveness uh, the efforts of the federal government is having in improving security for satellites, uh, what resources are, are being made available to the public, but more importantly, to what extent commercial satellite systems are reliant or being relied on by critical infrastructure and analyzing you know, what the threats are to your, your overall critical infrastructure and what contingency plans can be put in place. So I like this act because it's asking the right questions at the right time. I'd like to see more larger organizations, especially critical or or infrastructure organizations, just ask the similar questions. And I think you'll be stunned by some of the answers that uh, are coming up much faster in this area than you believe. Is this the kind of thing where, you know, folks who are uh, sitting on boards of organizations should bring this up as a a discussion point? You know, hey, this may sound uh, out of left field, but uh, to what degree are we relying on space infrastructure? I think that's the role of boards in, in governance is to really run through some of those scenarios and often to we, we go to what we know, which is finance and, and, and risk and whatnot. Um, and some of these uh, attempts to you know, discuss it might feel a little weird at first. Where like uh, I mentioned Ghost Fleet earlier, which is Peter Singer and August Cole's work, is storytelling um, to, to really communicate some of these ideas and to, um, to bring home some of the, these concerns. Um, so if you can talk to your board about this and you can bring in some real use cases or you can bring in some um, representative um, news stories or whatnot to really tell the story of what is happening out there, uh, other, other than going to Star Wars and and how you could have better protected the Death Star. Um, how can we make it real for them? How can we make them understand it? How can we attach it to risks associated with real um, business processes? Yeah, just make sure you don't have an exhaust port that's only two meters wide, right? And, and if you're going to have that exhaust port, Dave, don't put a stateful inspection and firewall that'll let one proton torpedo through. <laughs> Fair enough. All right, Kevin McGee, thanks for joining us. Thanks to all of our sponsors for making the CyberWire possible, especially our supporting sponsor, Cyber Reason. Ransomware shouldn't feel inevitable. You should feel invincible. Cyber Reason is undefeated against ransomware with the only predictive ransomware protection available. It's the ultimate defense against ransomware. Visit cyberreason.com to learn more. Thank you also to our friends at RSA Conference, where the world talks security. Through global events and year-round content, RSAC connects you to cybersecurity leaders and cutting-edge ideas for a safer, more secure future. Learn more at rsaconference.com slash cyberwire22. And that's the Cyberwire. For links to all of today's stories, check out our daily briefing at thecyberwire.com. The CyberWire podcast is proudly produced in Maryland out of the startup studios of Data Tribe, where they're co-building the next generation of cybersecurity teams and technologies. Our amazing CyberWire team is Rachel Gelfin, Liz Irvin, Elliot Peltzman, Trey Hester, Brandon Karp, Eliana White, Peru Prakash, Justin Sabi, Tim Nodar, Joe Kerrigan, Carol Terrio, Ben Yellen, Nick Vilecki, Gina Johnson, Bennett Moe, Chris Russell, John Petrick, Jennifer Iben, Rick Howard, Peter Kilpie, and I'm Dave Bittner. Thanks for listening. We'll see you back here tomorrow.
And now, a word from our sponsor, Cyber Reason. They're out there, and they're coming for you. Ransomware attackers, sophisticated criminal armies bringing organizations to their knees and costing companies millions. But ransomware shouldn't feel inevitable. You should feel invincible. Cyber Reason is undefeated in the fight against ransomware, with the only predictive ransomware protection available, automatically stopping attacks before encryption and empowering security teams with full visibility. It's the ultimate protection against ransomware, an AI-powered defense that defeats ransomware at every stage of the attack, stopping today's threats and ready for tomorrow's. True cyber defense designed for true defenders. Because ransomware won't define this era, those who defeat it will. Visit cyberreason.com to learn more. That's C-Y-B-E-R-E-A-S-O-N.com. And we thank Cyber Reason for sponsoring our show. <laughs> 